Welcome to the Modern Mythos Podcast, a show dedicated to the keepers and players of Call of Cthulhu and other investigative horror games. I'm John Hook. And I'm Seth Skrakowski, and together we'll be discussing writing, game mastering, and player tips, and how you can apply them to your table. Today we're talking about cult divinity loss. John and I recently played a cult with today's guest, Martin Hoyshaber, as our game master. And Martin, I know I just butchered that, so I apologize. No, Welcome to the show. Didn't. <laughs> well done, Seth. Hey, Martin, how's it going? <laughs> Uh, good, good. Uh, enjoying the day, and uh, was looking forward to recording with you. Oh, thanks. Yeah, it's, we're glad to have you. Very glad to have you, and um, also, you know, very good to speak to you again since we had uh, since you ran us through a game of cult not that long ago. Yeah, it, you you enjoyed it. I hope um, uh, all, all the horrors of of finance in this case. <laughs> I, <laughs> um, <laughs> I came up with it looking outside and seeing one of those money transports uh, passing by and thought, how would it be if, if, if I had a cult scenario that was revolving around money and people who transport something valuable but are actually quite poor and have debt and have a, a reason to uh, do shenanigans? So that was the, the core of, uh, of my scenario. Oh, that's really cool. Yeah. Yeah, I had a really good time. It was my very first game of Cult. It was one of my very first times getting to play it. I played it once at a uh, at, at Gen Con uh, a couple years ago as a player. And the, the GM is really kind of fast and loose with the rules. And so it's like, I, I played a game that, that sounded like Cult, but I don't really think how much it really followed it. Uh, so, and I've been, I've been running it for some time. So actually, you're the first time I've actually played it. And we definitely were playing Cult, <laughs> not... Not just kind of like, ah, it kind of works. Uh, so but thank you for that. Uh, so like, when did you get into gaming? Into gaming, I got, um, I always wanted to play something like uh, Dungeons and Dragons or uh, Das Schwarze Auge, which is a German version of that. I think there's now translation or uh, for a while, uh, The Dark Eye. But I didn't have any group to play with until I came to the UK three four years ago, I don't remember. And before that, I was watching Critical Role. I actually got in the, into watching actual plays with Titan's Grave, uh, a thing that Will Wheaton did, then discovered Laura Bailey, and uh, via that uh, Critical Role, like episode six or something, I started watching. Uh, listened to uh, the, episode, uh, the episodes most of the time, and... Two years later, after I've like listened to countless hours of Dungeons and Dragons, I decided, "Come on, I'm not going to meet any group. Um, let's try to start something at work." And yeah, I've watched enough. I can do this. I I'll just give it a try. I know the rules well enough by now to just run the game, um, which was a tremendous success at work. Uh, just the scheduling is is always difficult. But as soon as it started, it's suddenly like like you burst a bubble, and then you're like, "Oh, you you're running D and I also play for <laughs> all of you people while I was looking for you." <laughs> right? Yeah. yeah that, that 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 does seem to be how it goes. Uh, uh, very feast or famine of like I can't find anybody, or uh, now I have to actually turn people away or my group's getting too crowded because everybody wants to be there, um, which isn't a terrible That's, problem to yeah. have. Uh, are you playing other games besides Cult? So I do play uh, Vampire the Masquerade, mostly running because uh, um, as soon as you start GMing, it's like, oh, you GM, can I play in your group? <laughs> and I do enjoy uh, GMing a lot. Uh, there's a few games that I want to run on my shelf that I haven't gotten to play, but I'm actually in a Hunter the Vigil campaign as well. What what is? But what is that? I've, Hunter the Vigil is part of the Chronicles of Darkness line that uh, came off the Vampire, uh, the Masquerade, Resurgence, and then Vampire the Macri Requiem. And Hunter the Vigil is you playing in one of the tears so it's not just vampire hunter it's monster hunter and depending on which tier you go you play in a different 
environment. So we're uh, playing in uh, Maleus Maleficarum group that are basically mercenaries or, or in this case, brothers of the Vatican hunting vampires in Eastern Europe. I don't remember. It's not Romania. Um, but uh, we've also played one game of Network Zero where we were investigating people disappearing close to Chernobyl, which was one of the scariest things that I've ever played in. And the best of them all is Task Force Valkyrie, which is a mixture of Men in Black meets uh, the X Files. So you're you're dressed like the '90s, but equipped like Men in Black. And it was one of the most hilarious games uh, I've ever played. And <laughs> so, one of the things I always wanted to do whenever my my friends used to try like talk me into playing vampires, like I always want to play Vampire Hunter. So the fact that you're going to do is like, oh, thank God, uh, just because. Th- th- that was, you know, that was the part that always interested me uh, more than playing the monster was like, what if you're just a regular guy? Cause these things are so powerful and so terrifying and you don't have all the, the really cool superpowers. You're just a, a little sack of meat. And uh, so, no, that sounds, that sounds great. <laughs> uh, I'll offer to run some, some hunter the vigil for you. You're running a game for you anytime. I remember vividly watching a video that I should probably not have watched and ending up like seeing the God Machine, um, which is in uh, Chronicles of Darkness, one of the, the like underlying principles. And then only being able to say TikTok, TikTok, write it down. I would read something completely meaningful, but everybody else around me, he's just writing TikTok, TikTok, or saying it. Oh. And I took that into role play immediately. And when, like, oh, you, something's playing on the, uh, the, the radio, you hear TikTok or, or the other way around. It's uh, um, uh, everybody's just hearing TikToks on the radio. And you're like, oh, yeah, that, of course. That that I love that song. I love it so much. <laughs> you know, what's happening? <laughs> now, That's awesome. Uh, with with with, yeah, with cult divinity lost. What 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 drew you into cult? I think I started listening to the glorious campaign by Red Moon Role playing. Uh, that mm. is the vampire one. Uh, uh, no man is an island, and from there on, I got sucked into the Black Madonna they played. I looked into it and it was like immediately I fell in love with that genre because I like that urban fantasy. I like playing in a world that could be ours. I like the lore. <laughs> the artwork in that book is is just That's phenomenal. Amazing. And that was just immediately also rules wise it, it, it immediately clicked. It's not very difficult. And as soon as Red Moon Role Playing announced that they have a Patreon tier where you could play as well, I'm like, "Come here, take my money!" <laughs> and and I started playing with Yalma, who like I think I was his first um, person that he GM'd for, and we've been playing for almost three years now. I've been uh, starting as an aware character, not as a sleeper, which would be the tier zero. And we're now after two years playing every other month and some uh, for the beginning monthly uh, at the point where I'm transitioning to an enlightened character. I think is the, I always mix those tiers up, but the tier two characters. So and that was probably fully improvised with a little bit of notes from me on his side. Don't get to see the GM notes in this case. That's one of the <laughs> perks you get as a GM. You know everything. It's, it's also one of the hardest parts if you are the, uh, the regular, the GM of like, I didn't realize how much my comfort blanket was knowing what was coming next and not knowing what's coming next is suddenly like really, really, really weird. Uh, so no, I get that. Yeah, I do too. Yeah. That's, I feel like that's what draws me into being a, uh, a permanent game master is getting to know all the secrets and watching it, you know, uh, slowly unfold uh, as the other players are discovering it, but it is weird being on the other side of that coin. Yeah, not not knowing <laughs> what's behind the door is suddenly really weird. <laughs> yeah, the, the players are used to not knowing what's yeah. behind the door. I'm used to knowing, so when I don't, I'm like, oh god, this is something really scary uh, because I always know <laughs> what's behind the door. Yeah, indeed. But 
I do like it when a player throws a curveball and like, oh, I want to go down to the basement. And like, I didn't know there was a basement. How exciting is that? I, I now need to make a, a, a basement on the spot. What could I put in there? Oh, my God. What skeletons can I find to put in that closet? So that makes me really excited. When, when a player throws, uh, can I try something? Or, hey, I've got an idea, but that might derail the whole thing. I'm like, yeah, please, go ahead. That, that, that's my juice. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, yeah, and that is great. That's the sign of a really good GM, the the yes and and, you know, leaning forward into uh, what your players are suggesting. So kudos, man. That's that's really awesome. Thank you. High praise from someone like you who, who've done this much, much longer. I've done this for three years now. Well, well Cult is also a system that does allow for uh, just an incredible amount of, of improvisation, especially since it's... yes. Uh, the, the the powered by the apocalypse system is is very geared toward uh, just if somebody says is there you know is there a basement of the house you know the well absolutely because it is a lot uh, I don't know it's 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 very aimed toward it mm-hmm. and I find it much easier to do with that system than I do with really any of the others that I, I play where you can just wing add just huge portions just on the fly. And it's, I don't know, it's one of the things that I do like about it. It also does really wear my brain out very quickly because it is so much more winged uh, on, on the game master's part than, um, you know, in, in Call of Cthulhu, I've, I've done everything beforehand that I can. So my, my, my brain power is not on that type of improvisation. My brain power is mostly on, you know, the other types of improvisation that you have to do. So uh, it is, it is a, a, a very different system in that sense. Uh, can you elaborate? I, I don't understand what other parts of improvisation you mean. Well, with, with, with Cultivity Lost, a lot of it is you're building up the, the concept of the, the characters are in the situation. And even with their disadvantages and whatnot, those are all meant to introduce sometimes very large portions to the game as far as... <laughs> Uh, you know, these events are, are going to happen because it's very character based. Call of Cthulhu, you're mostly trying to solve an investigation. So, with that, it's usually who did it, how they do it, why they do it. You've, you've got to get all that out of the way. So, it's I'm much more inclined to have the map of the place set up and where certain things are. And we've got these skill checks that we use to find stuff. Well, Cult is, uh, we've got it, we've got a little bit of a, of a loose plot. And most after that, it's filled in by the players and the GM just kind of as we go versus uh, Call of Cthulhu. It's much more laid out and we're improvising different things that the characters are doing um, on top of that. But it's much more of a solid foundation, at least when I run it. Um, Colt is way looser. Gotcha, gotcha. One of the things that I find interesting about Colt is uh, it really wants to uh, invite the players to uh, to push limits, push boundaries on um, on taboos, on fear, uh, on you know on 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 things that uh, uh, you know people uh, crave, right? you know like into in the drug culture and things like that. And I found that really interesting to uh, to role play in the character in the that you provided for us. You know, as you were saying earlier, the scenario was we were transporting. We were in an armored car transporting uh, valuables from one location to another, and I was the driver. And I was a driver who has a drug addiction, uh, who has gambling debts, money problems. Uh, a long-term girlfriend who is now uh, nearing the end of uh, our first pregnancy. You know, it's her father that I'm working for, you know, who runs and owns this this transportation business and everything. And I got to kind of, you know, those were the the frameworks, and I got to kind of work within that. And I was like, you know, how can I really explore this this cult? game and and uh get into the to the things that they talk about so i decided even though it wasn't on paper on the on the pre-gen that uh this guy he feels 
trapped. This, this, you know, you know, girl, because it was all, you know, it was a really a kind of a rock and roll lifestyle. And now, you know, she's got it, you know, we're, we're pregnant and, and the kid's almost here. And now I was like, he's feeling super trapped and he'll do anything to get out of this. And I'm hoping that some of the decisions that I made during the game surprised you as the game master and uh and and had you you know made you need to pivot or do something not that i was trying to break the game but i was trying to uh make uh interesting decisions that hopefully would have a dynamic and interesting result to the to the storyline like using my handcuffs as a weapon (laughs) I mean, you're giving away uh, uh, almost uh, uh, um, the ending, but I think, first of all, the choice to play this, like I was playing, thinking of this, like uh, this is now a stable life choice. Uh, Everything is nice. I have a kid upcoming. I have a, a good employment and that employment is going away. And you're like flipping that coin already on its top. I'm like, Oh my god, that is way more interesting what uh, than anything I could ever write. So I was grateful that for that choice, and then sticking to that character and doing everything that would be in character. Um, that character would be running away from everybody else because there's no attachment to the other uh, guys in the group. There, there's no attachment. That drives that and like how to rear that in again, how to connect the group of four people that were in that transporter already presented a neat challenge. And they're like, okay, I want uh, want the group to come together, but it also needs to be a little bit weird. So I decided um, when you get out in front of the van, out of the front window, everybody running away from these people, coming to an emergency exit, yeah, that person that's next to the emergency exit, they've got powers to make doors. They've got powers to make uh, pathways. So that suddenly leads to you turning up to up next to them and, and the whole group being reassembled and uh, seeing what that group dynamic then does. And uh, going to the very end, it ended splendidly. Uh, splendidly uh, I, I think it's yours to to tell that story because uh, um, you did it. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, I, I mean, I thought it was interesting. Well, Seth, tell us about your character uh, and and how we right. interacted with each other. Well, uh, we were we were doing a, a job transporting uh, a, a, a valuable box because uh, that was really all that was important was the box that we're transporting. Uh, my character was a police officer who. Uh, had gotten in a, a wreck with, uh, it was like the police commissioner, wasn't it? The, or some, somebody very high yeah, up. Uh, head of the Metropolitan uh, metropolitan Police. That's like head of London uh, Police. And um, it, w- it actually was not his, uh, the character's fault. Uh, but it ended up you know, coming up in a report that he was, he was drunk while it happened. And uh, so he's, he's basically in a lot of trouble insurance wasn't going to, to cover it. And he ended up getting this opportunity mm-hmm. uh, that if he just did this job delivering this item, which was to the same the guy, the head of the, the Metropolitan Police, he would, uh, all that record would just go away. Uh, so his, his entire uh, focus was on, I have to deliver this in, in order for all of this uh, stuff that's going on in his life as a result of this kind of bogus charge to go away. Uh, so that's part of the, uh, one of the things I did like about the way that was set up is because John had a sense of escape. I need to get out of here and this might help me escape and, 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 you know, have start a new life somewhere else. Mine had a, whatever happens, I have to get this delivered because that's how I can get my life back in order. Uh, so it was very, uh, diametrically opposed. His, his character had no interest really in delivering the goods, but he might be able to use the goods to further his agenda. Mine was entirely on, I have to get this to the spot so my life goes back together. Uh, so that that did at least have that conflict of, I, I needed to get the job done. And he had a, uh, screw the job. Let's just... <laughs> 
you know, let's 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 vanish in the night with this thing. I mean, uh, that thing was valuable enough that you could have just stole it and made your life uh, in a different place. I, I think um, that option might have been on the table, but um, it's the player's decision to to run with something like that that I love, and you being so focused to get in contact with that guy who was responsible for the box and learn something about what it does. And uh, when you tr- saw through the illusion, you saw a bit of that box that was weird and weird about that character and how you all ran with it in embracing all that weirdness and playing it for real. That is something that I miss in many actual plays that play cult one-off sees where it's like oh that guy got a third eye and i'm a regular human and i'm playing for laughs because i think this is a dream even in a dream that's probably scarier than anything and what i loved about your role play is like everything that you did felt like a genuine human reaction to the terror that you're encountering to the obstacles that you're encountering. Um, yeah, I think that, that makes great role play. That's something I wanted to, to, to kind of toot your horn and praise you for Martin is, uh, you know, in this scenario, there was an NPC that, and I think it was basically due to the roles that Seth and I made. I perceived this, this NPC one way, which was monstrous <laughs> And Seth's character saw him another way, which was human. Uh, the box was weird, but the guy was human. And and that became a linchpin. And one of the things that I thought was amazing in the way that you ran this is there was never a definitive resolution on was that NPC a monster or human? But Seth and I just reacted to this guy differently in different ways because of what our perceptions were and that was as far as our characters were concerned that was the gospel right and so that it was that npc you know i i was able to because uh, seth was a, a police officer and i was acting all squirrely he eventually handcuffed me and uh, i was able to get the cuffs off and during a moment of that just kind of happened you know during a moment of confusion and everything i was able to to get my at least one cuff off and uh and i talked about how you know the cuffs have that one portion that that kind of has a a point on it it almost looks like a velociraptor kind of claw and you were like yeah yeah i said well i want to hold that and just tear it through this guy's throat and you're like yes absolutely and you know i ended up murdering straight up murdering this guy and you know it's a dead body no resolution like he didn't he didn't you know change into some kind of monster or something but as far as i was concerned the monster was defeated and as far as seth was concerned i just straight up killed somebody in front of him and uh, rightly went to jail for it and everything but uh i thought that was so cool that it wasn't a you know a, a hard fact in the game that was resolved. It was ambiguous. Game is over. It was still ambiguous. And I thought that was awesome. Cool. Yeah, I like that. Uh, I, I know from a previous podcast and Seth's videos that he usually prefers to have the option to find out. And uh, indeed there was, if you talk to him a little bit longer, if that last moment of hope, um, you spun a story about how, he can find someone that might be able to help him. Like he would have disclosed that he feels cursed. He feels like there are bumps on his, uh, his back that uh, he doesn't see, but he feels that he sees the perceives the world through that. And like there were eyes opening out on his back, 10 eyes that um, Seth could feel and you could see. And those yellowish eyes that, were, were uh, reminiscent of uh, those terrible, terrible depictions of angels that you have in the early Bible, not in, in the like late Bible with Jesus. But uh, since cult is a lot based on that Gnostic uh, lore and mythology, I I saw one of the pictures of a of an angel of Yisot in there, 
and like those angels with wings and I think hun- uh, uh, yeah, dozens of eyes dozens on of their eyes wings. On yeah. And you're like, oh, he's, he's cursed. He's in, interacting with this uh, uh, head of the police and suddenly a curse spreads onto him and he's getting those eyes to open up and he feels his life draining away. And then he's got to transport that pox that, in addition, drain something out of him as far as Seth's seen. And not all influences are the same. The, the box contained a pen that was tied to the underworld and she who waits below. So the cult lore that I use to run every game of mine, like if I run a vampire game and I have a Ventru, then Ventru is at least vaguely associated to Ysort, the Archon of Greed. Similar, um, a Malkavian would be associated with some other uh, uh, forces in, in, in cult. Okay, well, well, cult's also, uh, again, because it has you have the, 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 the ten archons, the ten death angels, and each of those has its own uh, theme. Of it, mm-hmm. it, it, it's very geared toward the, the scenarios and the encounters have those themes of uh you know such so this one was was greed uh so it's like well this is the the archon these are the types of forces that are working against you or just in in the vicinity uh because this is the theme that we're going with uh so when when you are writing your scenarios do you start with the theme normally or do you kind of come up with this situation and they kind of look at it and say i think this is the theme most associated and then go that way um, usually it's the latter, but it's very early on. Like I had the idea of the transport and people transporting valuable stuff. So, um, that immediately guided me towards you sort the Archon of greed. And then like, what can I bring around that fit that topic of greed? I probably want a faction that is against that. Mr. Midas and the people that were uh, hijacking that van were doing that in opposition to Simon Lockdale, the who actually was a lictor of Yesod, who is like trying to to enforce those powers. And within that group that you could have met was a group that was tied to She Who Weeps Below, who's like tied to nihilism, and. I start with an idea, then go to the principles, and uh, from the principles go back to ideas. It's not something that goes one way. It's it, it's like circles or spirals or something no. um, that make make each other move further in, in directions. Okay, no, that, that that makes sense. Uh, very rarely is it always uh, inspiration follow just one direction it's usually this leads to this and like oh i could i could you know it'll, it'll link to this and say oh well, these two together and then they go this way so a lot there is a lot of back and forth as far as um at least how my creativity process works as far as uh different things inspire different things so there's not really a pattern it's just kind of a uh, uh chaos that's crystallizing into a shape uh versus a a uh, recipe of you know this leads to this that leads to this and boom adventure uh so I, I also enjoyed the fact that with that one, you know, I, I knew because the 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 lore and everything that we'd entered underworld, and I, but there is the the concept and cult. There really aren't good guys. Uh, there's not like a good faction. So the the people that were were boosting our armored car that we started running from. There isn't uh, like ah, you were running from the good guys. No, you were running from a different type of of bad guy you're working for a bad guy and the people are chasing you are different types of bad guys there's not like a a a a good power that you know you should really hook up with it's just different types of just self um you know just the very very selfish powers for whatever their purposes are and you're kind of in the middle of it yeah, I think there are a few neutral ones that just serve themselves, like the gods of Elysium are, are, are things that I consider not engaging with anybody uh, uh, like on malicious terms, which is very different from 
say, people or, or entities that are tied to Inferno. But yeah, most people have motives to that further themselves. And if you get in touch with a power that furthers your interest, that is probably the best you can get. It's just aligned with your principles. It's not aligned with the fate of humanity or anything or, or making anything better. That's probably also something that makes me like play D and D very differently because your heroes are always like for the greater good and like uh-huh. <laughs> nope, not my type of game. <laughs> <laughs> now, but um, yeah, kind of with with that. Uh, so for I guess we were kind of like uh, jumped in. What is the the world of cult? Just for for any listeners that aren't really aware of kind of the. The, the, the elevator pitch description. So the elevator pitch is you all, we all are humans. We know the world that we live in, in and out, but this world actually is just a, a trap. It's just a veil that's been put on us because we humans are divine. We've lost a divinity at some point in, in history and we are now jailed in our bodies, in our reality, much similar to, say, the Matrix in, in uh, the Wachowski movies. We are trapped in there, and the process of becoming from a sleeper to an aware character to an uh, awakened character or a enlightened character is to not know anything that this reality is just a fabrication to knowing a little bit about that this reality is a fabrication and you wanting to break out of it through madness, through drugs, through passion or other means. And cult is set in that universe with a whole lot of uh, mystery and uh, stories and lore from taken from Christian Judean Gnosticism on top. And building your breaking reality uh, to get out of your imprisonment as a human and achieving your divinity again. Very hopeful, but that's not a human hope. That's not a like at the end of the journey, you are not human anymore. And you're probably as far from a human as one of Clive Parker's invention is. It's not a, like something wholesome. <laughs> I um, one of the whenever I've I've talked about cult before, uh, one of the the the, the, the common t- terms that's been used is you know cults say color Cthulhu but without a sense of hope. And you know my response has always been, um, color Cthulhu, there is no hope. Ultimately, humanity is doomed. That is. That's the plot. We are absolutely meaningless mm-hmm. in in the greater sense, and the, the most we can do is hold off the eventual destruction of, of humanity, and the universe will not remember us. Uh, cult, the the idea is, uh, which you know, the Matrix is always the, the best example because that's the one most people are familiar with. Is like the humanity is the center of the universe. Everything is actually built around them uh, and, and and keeping them imprisoned and, and using their power. So the quest of the game is to break free and ascend. So instead of being meaningless in a world that's ultimately doomed, you're actually, st- for me, cult is you're starting off at the lowest of the low and your, your goal is to, awaken and, and break free and, and basically achieve w- what it is you're supposed to be, which is, you know, this, th- this divinity that humans have. So that was kind of like the, it is a, it is as much geared towards a darker game, but I think that actually has that gleaming hope at the end versus, you know, any call of Cthulhu scenario or, or, or campaign at the end, ultimately humanity is going to be doomed in, in the, in the grand scheme of things, we all we've done is held off near our for, you know, a little bit longer versus cult is uh, eventually the machine will break and we will break free and may, and I will, I will achieve this. Maybe not this life, but eventually I will, humanity will break free, hopefully. Um, so that's, 
I was kind of, I was like, for instance, it has more hope to me, even though it, it, it is, it is a much darker journey and you aren't human by the end of it anymore because your divinity has been brought back to you or remembered, I guess. Yep. Good, good summary. I think that like what struck me once was the realization that the reason why we are behind the veil and why we're imprisoned is because everybody fears humanity going back to divinity again. And that reign of humans must have been something terrible. <laughs> that, that, that is what the thing at the very intro of the book talks about. We were, you know, gods, we were beautiful and terrible. And many of the things that have imprisoned humanity that were at least the book even explains what they are. Uh, talks about it, it fears us because humans weren't necessarily good. It is the, if, 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 if somebody was given absolute power, absolute power corrupts absolutely, you're probably going to do some of the worst things. If everyone had absolute power, what would that world be like? And it is the idea of, like, is the illusion actually that keeps humanity in prison, is it deserved? Because humans are probably going to follow their more just selfish and terrible instincts. And the, the illusion, while it is terrible for humans realizing what they're in, Maybe that actually was for the best, uh, because what happens when they're free, and like you know what happens to all of the things that are keeping us here? It, it, yeah, it was more of a retro, it was more of a retaliation from certain points of view of humanity got trapped versus uh, like oh they were good and these bad things trapped them. It was like humans were probably awful and these things trapped them, and those things are probably uh, retaliating against these. Uh, entities that probably were horrible to them for you know, an eternity beforehand, but it doesn't necessarily mean that the the people that are getting kicked on are good. <laughs> they were probably worse. So it, it, it there there isn't like I said a sense of good, but from the human point of view, I see there is hope. U ultimately, the machine, the illusion is is crumbling, and maybe maybe this will be the the, the incarnation where I get free or I get far enough along that my next incarnation can get free. And uh, cause one of the other concepts for it is human humanity was trapped in this matrix of a, a fake reality that is also rewriting itself. So, you know, in the matrix, when they talk about the, there was the glitch and all of a sudden the windows are, are bricked up, the illusion uh, will do that. So instead of like call of Cthulhu, where you can get a photograph of the monster and show the world, uh, in, in, in cult, anything, everything is part of the illusion. So it can be, like you take a photograph of the monster and the photograph could just be whatever it is that the illusion dictates that it is because the photograph is part of the illusion. Everything is part of it. So the, uh, the, the world will rewrite itself to maintain the illusion at all cost, But at the same time, the illusion, the machinery that keeps it powered is breaking. And that basically the, the concept of the game is we're starting after the machine uh, started cracking and these, uh, these glitches begin occurring. And this is what allows humans to start getting toeholds to start pulling themselves out of it is it's, it's no longer a flawless illusion and things peek through. And maybe if the characters are really good, they can use those little cracks to, climb out of this is it the breakdown of that illusion that is what kind of what started uh the scenario we played driving into a tunnel and then suddenly the walls and everything are so close the vehicle just basically gets stuck because you know the walls have all kind of jammed in on it um not quite mr midas who was that party opposed to um to Simon Lockdale, uh, who was your your uh, not employer, but the uh, person that gave you the the, the job, used uh, the fact that uh, you're going down into underground and then extended with his powers um, your stay in that and put you in a place that was was very much then not uh, uh, your regular reality, but underworld. So it's not just like you can fall through the illusion, really, probably, 
but more likely I think it is that somebody else like uses uh, what a place where the illusion is thin and uh, opens that a little bit wider because uh, that's places where you can crack it open. And one thing that I personally do, when you see through the illusion, when you're in in the illusion or beyond the illusion, you then see back into the reality and you're like seeing it. Uh, uh, like I remember you trying to see through the illusion there and then realizing you're very close to cars and the whole traffic system that is just like... Mm, like a membrane away you 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 can push through if you have the powers but the illusion works both ways i have the feeling um that's where the scenario started well that was it was cool it was a it was i enjoyed it it was a really good scenario and uh it was a fun character to uh to try and bring to life so I can definitely uh, post my notes on that scenario and um, the character sketches that I gave you the backgrounds. I just have to tidy them one up and uh, fix the typos in there and put them either give them to you so you can put it as a Patreon extra or uh, put it on the server. You know what? I'll start a channel in the Discord, in the Modern Mythos Discord, uh, called Cult. And post it there. Will do. Now, uh, n- n- now, Martin, it's you know, but I'm so happy to get somebody to talk about cult with because I always try to talk about it with John. He's like, I'll get ready to read this someday. But he's like, ah, it's something I enjoy. <laughs> um, what uh, you know, we we've talked about like what we enjoy about it. What sort of criticisms do you do you have for cult, if any? So it requires a lot of improvisation. If that is not your bulk like like the the place where you're happy um all of the moves uh, so instead of rolling a skill check you roll a move that um is associated with what you want to do all of these have on a 15 or higher you succeed on a 10 to 15 uh, to 14 you succeed but something happens in addition to that on a 10 or lower you might even get what you want, but at a dire cost, a dire consequences, or you don't get what you what happens. That middle section makes you always be on your toes. That oh. if that's not not your type of game, like cult is not for you. It is. Well, as I say, it's it's exceptionally improv heavy, uh, and <laughs> you know by that it's it's the player rolls two d ten, and they can have modifiers, and they're not big modifiers. It's usually. You know, one, two, or three. Uh, very rarely do you see modifiers that are bigger than than three. Uh, so it's not like you're getting a plus eight or something. And when you start, you know, breaking down mathematical averages, getting that fifteen or higher is 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 not a big chance. You're most likely going to get that middle. Uh, mm-hmm. But um, so having that total success of the player says, "I want to do this," and they get exactly what they want is is a rarity, uh, you know, in the on, on the on the average of having consequences or anything. And mm-hmm. game masters don't roll dice at all, which I found so freaking weird the first time. I didn't realize how much I used dice to get my own thoughts in order. Uh, <laughs> one of the one of the, the classic things people always talk about when it comes to GM dice is like, uh, if you if you're not going to pay attention to the dice, why are you bothering rolling? It's like I sometimes roll to decide what it was I actually wanted. Of <laughs> you know, yeah. Is, yeah. is there anything behind the door? I'll, I'll roll the die. And the thing is, I didn't decide beforehand if high meant yes or low meant no. I roll the die, and whatever it lands on, I'll go with my first instinct of like, yes, there's a thing behind the door. Let's go forward. But or I'll roll it, and if I'm disappointed in the result, I'm like, nah. And that's how I make up my mind. It's not that I I use the dice to tell me what it's supposed to be. My, I use my dice to tell me what I wanted it to be. And that's, that's what I go with. So as, as a game master, I've done that for decades. And I never realized how important the rolling a die to help make my mind up quicker was important. And then I've cult and it's like, I don't roll dice for anything. I just, I'm just completely going by what the, the players have rolled and I'm interpreting dice. And so many times I wanted to have the, 
option to throw a die to tell me what I wanted, that I eventually did bring a die back behind my screen. Uh, so I can roll the die to tell me what it was I even wanted to do, um, almost like a, a dousing rod uh, versus <laughs> <laughs> versus anything else. Uh, so because that level of improvisation does suck your brain up very, very quickly. Um, but so you found the middle area the hardest for you to do then? No, I think um, so. I did a year's worth of improv before I started role playing. And there I got disappointed because people always wanted to be funny and I wanted to have something serious. So now I'm playing cult and uh, I'm making people not be funny. But that's where what, what I like and that's where my brain wants to go to. But I have to acknowledge if your brain has difficulties with that, it might be a bit of a learning curve to adjust to, to, to that. Another thing that, um, like the advantages that are there, they are not balanced. Like when you have Dungeons and Dr Dragons party, um, you also know that the wizard is, is probably going to rock the boat at higher levels. But these advantages are it's unclear when they're very when they're applicable and when they're easy to use or which one are easy to use in general which are more niche and then that also ties a lot into what kind of scenario you are doing and sometimes you end up with players i know that uh other gms had that where it's like a complete mall fest when they're encountering uh, uh, baddies because they have the right advantages to just destroy them and other parties would be really really at a loss um, engaging something supernatural so these are not balanced and you have to think about them when you you run a game both as a GM as well as a player which one do I want to take which ones are good which ones are but I, I personally see that as I cult to me is a game that, that you have to have a m mature players for and, I, and not just mature due to subject matter. I mean, that's certainly part of it. Uh, but a lot of it is also mature gamers is in not uh, trying to game it of uh, uh, where it's like, I want to take the advantages that are just the most powerful that I see versus the ones that are going to be the most true to the character uh, that, that we're doing. Um, and, you, and you need that type of player that that's something they want. Otherwise, it just it does start throwing the game really out of whack. If, if the game master is trying to uh, do one thing and the players are trying to do another, that, that just it's not a system that's designed to handle it the way like you know D and D is or, or any of the other um, where it gets tactical games of you know we're trying to achieve balance and cults like we just expect you to be mature enough that you can you can do this with without having to worry about it as much. Uh, because I, I feel that if your players aren't all on board with what you're trying to achieve with playing this type of game, it, it's not going to go as smoothly. Um, yeah, it, it's just, it's not as forgiving as something like Call of Cthulhu, where there are much more, I guess, rigid rules in place to keep balance. And Call of Cthulhu, you don't have characters that have essentially hidden superpowers that might spring out, both both good and terrible. Um, so th that one was also difficult for me, is because sometimes, yeah, there's an advantage that is, oh, this is handy, and others are like, oh, so waves of power come out of you, and they can they can completely take out everybody in the room. And these are the same, you know, an intro character can get either. Like, it's like I can yep. either. Uh, uh, I can either hide from somebody that's following me a little bit easier, just a little bit easier, or waves of power can come out of me and I can kill everyone that's in like, you know, in, in an area the size of a room that I'm with. Um, hmm. Jeez, one of those seems a little bit more powerful than the other. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that that's that requires a a, a good group of players, I guess, uh, including the gym. Uh, a last bit that I wish was a little bit more laid out is that the adversaries, like monsters and higher powers, 
the stats are all all over the place. You have to uh, skim the book to find the right section. If you have a searchable PDF, it's a little bit better, but a PDF is horrendously OCR. That that is one of my biggest criticism of that PDF. It's like you can't find anything because they've gobbled up the letters under the PDF. It's it's not possible to search in the PDF properly. But going back to the adversaries, if you want to have like an angel that is associated with a higher power, an Aachen, what would their stats be, baseline, and what? how can I customize it? Or a dream prince, what would their powers look like? How many health points would they have? How many things that is like glossed over in that book that probably came last compared to writing all that juicy, juicy lore? And that is making things difficult, though by now I can wing it most of the time. If you attack, I started out none of those people that were with you, but I can wing it by now. Um, that, that is one of the issues is we, we do get lots of beautiful pictures and descriptions of, of some of the, the, the creatures and the powers and the, the opponents that you can reach. And then you're like, okay, what are their stats? And only a fraction of those have stats. And then you can actually, you can see a lighter uh, in one section and you can see a lighter in another. And they're actually very different as far as what their, their powers are. They're always very unique uh, as far as what they can do, depending on uh, what powers it served or serves. And one of the big things I wish is I, I know we're supposed to be able to customize these, but could you give me a starting point of, you know, just give me a vague idea of what we're, uh, what I should be going for as far as how powerful this should be or what sort of things it should possibly have at its disposal. Um, I, uh, that, I, I did a little work for them, which one day will eventually come out. And I did come across that a lot because then I would be sent stats for things that haven't been statted yet. It's like, Oh yeah, I went a completely opposite direction with that. Uh, let's, let's figure out how we're going to handle this because I envisioned it different. Uh, as far as how how many health points it should possibly have, or what sort of abilities this should possibly have, based off the description, and it wasn't that I felt like I was wrong or they were wrong. It was just different interpretations of this description text of uh, what what is this thing capable of, or what does this thing do. And I, I really wish the game had done a starting point for a lot more of the creatures. Game masters can always change what's there. But I think it's really good to give you a start, a, an idea, as well as because it is an improv heavy game, I might have to bring in a creature that I wasn't expecting to bring in until they they failed a terrible roll and uh, something through the illusion saw them or they failed a roll and all of a sudden I, oh, hell, we're in Inferno. Okay, well, what, what are they going to come across in Inferno? Oh, okay, they'll come across this. I have no stats for it. Let me Let me wing it. I wish I had stats for like a generic whatever it is right there so i can i can grab it and and go versus if i'm planning it beforehand i can really trick it out and customize it and make it unique i still want one that i can just oh i'm in this situation i didn't know it's going to be in two minutes ago well i don't want to i don't want to have to think about how to give this thing uh, proper powers I, I just want to grab one and get back to the game and that's the part that usually wears me out very quickly is I'm, I'm having to actually do the nuts and the bolts of the game on the fly when I would rather be work using that mental energy of what's it doing <laughs> versus what is mm -hmm. it. So by now my brain is, like can easily go to the what's it doing. And while I describe what it is doing, I like, uh, I start out a little bit like, Okay, this is being an inferno. This uh, it being an inferno means that it needs to be associated with a higher power, probably. So, if it's tied to, I don't know them by heart. If it's tied to torture, then it, it probably will be doing something torturous, and. That means it, what what does it need? Everything in Inferno has hooks and, and spikes, so I'll add those. And I'll 
you apply the players for for as long uh, like I don't need them to engage with everything oh. um, in a, a battle kind of way but um, yeah uh, I think that's that's thankfully also something that doesn't happen too often that they go down to inferno because my games start in reality and I haven't run anything long enough that they would encounter inferno I think I'd reserve that to when you start playing enlightened or aware characters, the, the, the second tier, when you're basically John Constantine in, in cult, when you're like, you know, there are powers, but you also know to handle them. And uh, while you don't handle them always the best way, you lose some souls on the way, like John Constantine does, you have your means to handle them. And that's when, when I think I would uh, introduce people to entities, encountering entities from Inferno and actually interacting with them. Otherwise, there's enough buffer between them that you ju- you can't can't touch this. That's a great comparison to uh, uh, liken it to the John Constantine storyline. So I think that's really cool. Uh, so it sounds like despite any of its uh, shortcomings, uh, Cult is a game that you would highly recommend. Uh, and is it safe to say that's it's your number one game? That's what you prefer to play? Yeah, definitely. Um, it's the game that I get to run most often. My second favorite is probably Vampire the Masquerade because I've run it most often. But there are a few books on the shelf that I love to run, um, like the Alien RPG like what else is there promethean and uh mage guys um the, the whole of of the chronicles of darkness that i would tie into that universe but uh mechanically i find them much more difficult to grasp because they they revel in that many resources to manage that feel uh-huh. almost not board gamey but um you have willpower, you have a blood pool, you have your hit points, you have your powers, and in and, and, and Cult Divinity Lost is, you have your stability, you have wounds that you need to take care of, and what happens when you get a wound, you get a minus one, two rolls. When you get your stability lower, you get disadvantages being, being more difficult, and at a certain stage of critical stress, seeing through the illusion becomes, becomes easier. But it's all like manifesting in you roll 2d10 and a fairly easy way to um, figure out what modifiers you have to add with those other games it's like i have to consult a book basically if you're not uh, if you're you're playing certain styles one thing though i did actually didn't want to talk about though is stability in the game because you know it, in others you have, you have a sanity mechanic and you have like oh if it gets low enough your your character is uh you know unplayable it's your mental hit points cult it's actually not uh you don't want to keep losing stability uh, it's not necessarily a good thing but it's not the end uh, because your character can hit zero stability and instead of it um, you're, you're suddenly babbling in the sane forever or, or whatnot, it can actually end up giving you an ex- experience or transforming your character further ahead uh, because they have hit this level of um, uh, basically, you know, I think it's called broken is the final one where you have see through the illusion yep. and ultimately it can actually excel you further, uh, but not in the most predictable ways. And that's one of the things I actually like about it is it, it it's it's rough getting there because like, if you can actually hit broken it's not always a bad thing and it's also not necessarily a your character is done for i've once managed in a one shot uh, my dice were cursed beyond beyond scale i think i rolled one keep it together that wasn't a complete and utter failure i managed to get f- within three hours to broken and um, my character committed suicide um, um, that's felt most appropriate in that scenario because uh, things have gone horribly wrong but 
stability. So to, to give a bit of an introduction, starts at composed. And at composed, everything is nice and dandy and you're, you're not worried about things. Then the next level of stress that you encounter, and let me get it from the book so I'm not uh, fumbling around, is moderate stress where your disadvantage rolls get a minus one. So it becomes a little bit more difficult to say if you're a drug addict to abstain from your drugs or if you have a bodily injury that's uh, like um, preventing you from functioning uh, at your normal range like that that becomes a little bit more difficult so uneasy and focused would be that the next level is shaken distress and neurotic getting serious stress where you get minus one to keep it together so then like at more at less stability, you become more likely to not sustain yourself, and your disadvantage rolls get a minus two. So abstaining from your drugs becomes more difficult. Which again drive the game. Those disadvantage can drive a game. You can just roll a game with two, three characters, their disadvantages, and and be done with it uh, and improvise it. At critical stress, anxious, irrational, and unhinged, you get a minus two to keep it together. So even less likely that yeah. you'll succeed your keep it together role. Minus three to your disadvantages, but a plus one to see through the illusion. You know, because and that it, makes it, it it's part of that kind of desirable. Yeah, all of a sudden you're you're actually knocked down so low that it begins it begins giving you small advantages. And then after that you hit broken, which can mean a lot of things. It can be the end of the character, but there is also the, your character might go through a transformation such as you might have two stats switch uh, with one another, which isn't, you know, necessarily good or bad, but it's also not the end of the character. It's just once they come out of it, they're different or you can get an experience point, which those are super you know, you know, like I think the most you can get in the game normally is five. Well, there's another way you can get one, and that is if you if you get knocked all the way down. And I, I just I, don't know, I find that a very interesting take because other games hitting the bottom of your sanity or stability mechanic is the end of the character. It's like not not in this, and it's not always bad. It just could be. Yeah, and um, and um, stability like if you're playing cult. The game, in my opinion, should revolve around that stability, both in losing it. So if you have a cult game and you don't roll ever a keep it together or, say, a, a whole scenario, I've listened to one or two where they don't do that, and listen, then you can play a different game. But stability interacts with your relationships because if you are uh, an aware character you regain stability by spending meaningful time with your relationships and those get you up to or one depending on your relationship strength in your stability there are advantages that allow you to also gain stability back but as far as i've listened to a podcast with Petr Nalo, one of the designers of the game, that is based on the psychology that he studied uh, in at university, that we process trauma through talking with other people. And same goes for going down stability. There are the four, if you have a success with complication, you have you become guilty, you become sad, you become angry, or you become scared. Those are the four base reactions that humans have and those are also based on psychological like evidence and psychological stu- studies that Peter Nalo did in his uh, um, university days. So it ties so many things together and, and also the way it's handled. Like It's not the game master who decides if you're becoming sad or scared. It's your decision as a player, which I love that player agency of, of what what is meaningful like uh, uh, to your character. Yeah. And that's saying that also comes to the, you, your mature players that would, you know, they think they, they, they can, they can do that and that's what they want and they can enjoy and not uh, try to game it. Uh, so that's what it's like. You, you, you do need that type of audience uh, or at least you know, participants with you. 
Mm -hmm. Yeah. Definitely. This was a great game. uh, And I know, Seth, and I greatly appreciated you running it for us. Uh, We'll need to uh, return the favor and have you in a Call of Cthulhu game. I think you'll enjoy that quite a bit. I think I'll do, uh, um, and I'll I'll make if if it's still in Wednesdays in the middle of the night, I'll make that happen for for a, a short bit. I can't commit to like months of it, but <laughs> one or two sessions, I think I can. Yeah, I'll, I'll, um, yeah, I'll for sure have a have a special game on a weekend for you. Amazing. <laughs> <laughs> I was just saying, this is this is great. I've enjoyed I've enjoyed talking uh, with especially about since. Yeah, there's so few people I really get to just geek out over over this game with. <laughs> <laughs> Most people just stare at me weird. Uh, it's, it's like, I've, I've, I've enjoyed it. So, but th- thank you for coming on, and th- thank you for running us, uh, Mike. I mean, maybe we can we can talk into it again, but at least maybe I can talk into it again. So, <laughs> uh, I don't think it needs a, a, a like much convincing to get me there again. Um, I want to uh, introduce the tarot of, of cult to you. So maybe we'll have an op- uh, opportunity to do that at a later time to do just a tarot reading and improv a game through and uh, wear your brain out in an hour, uh, in, in two hour sessions. That would be I cool. Would, I would love that, that would be cool. because I would, I would, I would actually love to, s- I've never been able to really get into the tarot of, 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 of the game. And I think that one, I would need somebody to help walk me through it because I've, I've read it and I'm like, I kind of get it and I don't get it. And I'll just, I'll go off to something else. So that would, that would be wonderful. Yeah. Anytime. Well, Bye. thank you again, Martin. And we cannot do the show alone. Uh, we want to thank our amazing editors, Max Mahaffa and Edwin Naki, for their hard work and keen skills in making us sound awesome. We also want to thank John Sumro for our badass logo. He's a very talented artist, so please follow him on Facebook, check out his official website, and please consider joining his Patreon account. Links below in the show notes. And finally, we want to thank the Darkest of the Hillside Thickets for generously allowing us to use their song Gluttony as our intro and outro music. If you're a fan of Lovecraft's writing and the Call of Cthulhu RPG, you really need to check out The Darkest of the Hillside Thickets. Check out their Bandcamp site and their official band site. Links for both will be in the show notes. Thanks for listening. Thank you. And thank you, Martin. Thank you. Thanks for doing this.